thank you all for joining us tonight for our talk. It's actually the last in our summer learning series and we'll start getting planning ready for the fall. But we are happy to present, the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program is happy to present Trees in Trouble, Invasive Forest Pests in the Adirondacks. My name is Emily Beldinen, a number of you uh, your names look familiar, and then we have some new faces in the room, so welcome. I am the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program's Education Outreach Coordinator, and I am very, very happy to welcome our speaker tonight, Dr. Gary Lovett. He is a senior scientist emeritus and forest ecologist at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, which is way far downstate from us in Millbrook, New York, but we love the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, so we're so happy to start working with them more. Oh, I'm going to put I'm going to put somebody on pause on mute for a second. Sorry. Uh, he received a bachelor's degree in biology from Union College and a PhD in biology from Dartmouth. Gary's research focuses primarily on the effects of air pollution, climate change, and invasive insects and diseases on forests. He is the author of over, over 140 scientific publications and editor of two books and has been elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Ecological Study of, of America, of society, I'm sorry. Um, fun fact, I'm dyslexic and so I'm doing great. Gary lives in the Hudson Valley and owns a camp in the Adirondacks where he spends as much time as possible and luckily did not come up this week to enjoy all of the buckets and inches and inches and inches of rain that we have. So I'd love to stop sharing my screen. Sorry, we're not ready for questions yet. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna go on mute and we're gonna give it away to Dr. Gary Lovett. All right, thank you, Emily Bell. And thank, thank all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm glad to see this interest in, in forest pests in the Adirondacks. Uh, it's an important subject and I like to see people uh, interested in learning about it. Uh, I am gonna share my screen here. Share screen, share, and bring up a presentation. Okay, can you see that? Good, good. Yeah, so we're, we are gonna talk about uh, invasive forest pests uh, and focus, focus it on the Adirondacks. We'll talk a little bit about the background of the problem nationally. Um, I, I like to start out with the big picture. Uh, I, I like this image. This, this image shows the uh, major sea routes of the world in green and the major air routes in blue. So these are uh, international, lines of connection. They connect our continents, they connect our cities, they connect our businesses, uh, but they also, it, it's worth considering that they also connect our ecosystems on different continents in a way they've never been connected before, at least not for the last hundred million years or so since the supercontinent of Pangaea was last fully together. So these lines um, bring us all sorts of great benefits in the international trade and travel that they provide, but they also uh, incur a number of risks. And we see these risks here in the Adirondacks. We have a number of unwanted visitors uh, that have come in through international trade. Uh, we have several widespread uh, forest pests, uh, including beech bark disease, balsam bully adelgid, and Lymantria dispar, that's, uh, uh, that's the Latin name for the gypsy moth. I don't know if you'd heard, but the Entomological Society of America has stopped using the common name gypsy moth because it's now considered an ethnic slur. So uh, they currently are searching for a new common name. If you, have any, uh, if you have any great ideas, you can send it to the Entomological Society or put it in the chat. It'd be great to, great to talk about it. Um, I'll probably be referring to them as gypsy moth because I've been referring to them as gypsy moth for 40 years and I don't know if I can train my brain not to do that. But anyway, uh, those are the most widespread pests in the Adirondacks. There are several pests that have a foot in the door. Uh, that is, they have a small outbreak uh, somewhere in the Adirondacks uh, and they're likely to spread. And that includes the hemlock woolly adelgid and the emerald ash borer. You probably heard of those. And then we have a number of pests that are sort of waiting in the wings. They're elsewhere in New York State or elsewhere close by uh, that could move into the Adirondacks in the near future, including oak wilt, spotted lanternfly, beech leaf disease, Asian longhorn beetle, and a lot of others. Uh, uh, the list goes on. 
Gary, we lost your audio. I think you might be on mute. I think we're going to get him back. <laughs> oh. Technical difficulties. If you haven't been on Zoom, this is what happens on Zoom. So thank yeah. you, Gary. Gary, we lost you as the list goes on. Okay. Uh, well, that was the last thing I said. I don't know what happened there. Can you you can hear me now? Yes, yeah, sound great. Okay, and you can see the slide. Absolutely. Yeah. I must have clicked something. I shouldn't click there. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let me let me go back a little bit here. Okay, we did that, we did that. Okay, so we, of course, in the Adirondacks, we're not the only place that has this problem. Uh, this map shows the number of in, uh, forest pests by county uh, for the United States. And you can see a couple of things from this map. Uh, first of all, pretty much anywhere in the US that has a forest has a forest pest problem. Um, and the problem is worse in, in the Northeast and the upper Midwest and also on the West Coast. And it's particularly bad in our part of the Northeast. And in fact, New York State has more forest pests than any other state. So we're, we're number one, that's great, isn't it? Um, you could see from the map, the inside of the map there, it's really uh, the, the worst parts are down. It was some areas of central New York, but down in the lower Hudson Valley where I am. But the Adirondacks has a lot of pests also. So uh, we here in the Northeast are getting the worst of this problem. I'll talk a little bit about the cost of this. Uh, there's been some studies done on the cost of these uh, imported insect pests. Uh, and this was a surprise to me when I, when I first saw it. it. These are forest pests. You might expect that the forest products industry would be the biggest, uh, would, would undergo the greatest damages from these pests, but that's, that's actually not true. You can see that timber owners and federal government are paying a minor a portion of the total cost. And most of the cost is being played by local governments and homeowners. The total cost is in the order of four to five billion per year, but we know that that's an underestimate. I'll talk about that in a second, but this, this fact that the local governments and homeowners are footing most of the bill uh, was a bit of a surprise to me. But when you think about it, it makes some sense. If you lose a tree in a forest, then you lose the value of that tree. But if, you, if a tree dies uh, in your yard next to your house, or if it dies on the street, then you have to take that tree down because it's a safety hazard. And that takedown of trees is very expensive. And that's what cranks up the cost for the local governments and the homeowners. And the homeowners are getting a double whammy on this because not only do they have the cost of taking down the tree, but when they take down that tree, uh, they lose property values because your property value declines if you lose a, a big, a beautiful tree in, the, in your yard. So, uh, so homeowners and local governments are really footing most of the bill for this problem of imported forest pests. And I said, we know this is an underestimate of the true cost of imported pests because number one, it's only the insects, uh, the uh, diseases are not included here, but also it doesn't include any of what they call the non-market values of these things, of trees. Uh, and that includes things like the recreational or aesthetic values, but it also includes services like cooling and and uh, absorption of, of stormwater and cleaning the air, those sorts of services that trees provide, uh, that's not included in, in this. So this is a, I don't think this is the last word on the cost of this, but it does give you a sense of, of who's paying for the damages. Of course, and when we talk about the impact of these pests on communities, it's really more than economic, right? Uh, so I think these, photos illustrate that as well as anything. So the top two photos are a before and after picture of a street in Toledo, Ohio, uh, after the, before and after the emerald ash borer attacked and killed all the ash trees along that street. And the bottom pair of pictures is before and after for a street in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, before they had to take down those trees to stop an Asian longhorn beetle eradicate, uh, uh, outbreak. So they tr were trying to eradicate the, the Asian longhorn beetle. So you can see from both of these pictures that if you lived in that neighborhood, it's not just a matter of economics and maybe your taxes go up because you have to fund the cost of these tree takedowns. It's also a matter of community character and quality of life in the neighborhood that you live in. Now I'm going to spend most of the time of this talk talking about ecological impacts. Uh, and the place to start here 
and uh, I'm an ecologist, so that's naturally where I would gravitate and talk like this. But the, the place to start is that these introduced pests are the only threat to forests that can reduce major tree species to ecological insignificance in a matter of decades. And of course, the poster child for this is the chestnut. Uh, this picture on the right is a chestnut grove from North Carolina taken in about 1910. I think you probably know that in about 1904, uh, a disease was introduced to the US, a disease of chestnut called the chestnut blight. And within 30 or 40 years, it had spread throughout the range of American chestnut. And uh, the American chestnut was a dominant tree species throughout the mid-Atlantic states and up into well into New York. In, fa in fact, the, the fringes of the Adirondacks had chestnuts as well. It was in some places not only a dominant tree species, but the dominant tree species. And of course it grew to huge sizes like these pictures uh, show here. So within a couple of decades, uh, this tree was reduced to uh, basically, you can still find saplings around, but you can't find any adult trees anymore. This is just, so I was just showing this to uh, remind you of what we've lost and what we have to lose. And this happened to chestnut in the last century. It happened to elm in the last century. And this is what's happening to ash right now from the, from the emerald ash borer. And hemlock may not be too far behind. And when, of course, when we talk about trees dying from these forest pests, the impacts go beyond the tree itself. In fact, they reverberate through the forest ecosystem. And a, and a great example is provided by the hemlock woolly adelgid because there's been quite a bit of research done on this. I'm sure you've heard of this organism. It's a tiny uh, insect that uh, feeds at the base of hemlock needles. This is a little black dot here in this, in this photo in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, it basically inserts its stylus into the uh, ray parenchyma cells and sucks the juices out of the, out of the plant. And of course, a few of these would not harm a tree, but millions and millions of them on the tree will eventually kill it. Uh, and so hemlock, uh, eastern hemlock, is one of our major old world species. Uh, and uh, it creates its own microhabitat. It casts a deep shade that doesn't allow many other things to regenerate underneath it. So it controls these forests for a long period of time. That's what we call a foundational species in forests. And when you kill the, the overstory hemlock trees, like this picture shows, a lot of things happen. Uh, number one, of course, you get a shift in the composition of the vegetation. You're, gonna, uh, you're, you're causing a decline in these old growth forests. You're going to release successional plants. And you also allow the entry of a lot of invasive plants. A number of stories, uh, studies have shown that. We get changes in carbon storage and nutrient retention. So there'll be uh, changes in the carbon sequestration capacity of the forest. And, and uh, the ability of the forest to retain uh, like nitrogen pollution from air pollution. Uh, I, I study that a lot and we can talk about it at length if you want, but I'm not gonna bore you with it right now. And we know also that the decline in these hemlocks causes decline in, in bird species. That you, as you get a shift in vegetation composition, you often get a, uh, a shift in, in bird species. A study in Connecticut showed that the decline of hemlock in the forest there, which are primarily mixed hardwood hemlock forests, uh, caused a decline of 93% uh, in this uh, black-throated green warbler population. Of course, you know, there's always, when you have a change like that, there's some winners and some losers, but uh, the, uh, the winners in this case were things like cowbirds and uh, other uh, edge type species, whereas the uh, species that are specialists on conifers and those mixed forests like the black-throated uh, green warbler uh, declined precipitously. And of course, hemlocks often grow along streams and uh, because they cast that deep shade, uh, they cool the stream and they keep the temperatures low. And uh, when those hemlocks are lost, the stream is opened up, allows more sunlight in and that can warm the streams and that can impact fish that, are, that need those cold water spawning habitats like the brook trout that's shown in this picture here. So this one little bug uh, attacking the, the hemlock trees caused all these effects in the ecosystem. And that's just an example. All of these pests are doing the same thing. And these pests, can, these effects can last for a long period of time. We've been doing modeling work to look at uh, how long this lasts. And, and the issue is that when you change the species composition, when the pest stays there, you're changing it per, uh, almost permanently. And the change in tree species composition cha causes changes in the forest soil. And those last for a long period of time, centuries, as you say. So this, this uh, ramifies out for a long time. So back to our list here. Um, 
we have a number of uh, forest pests that I told you about. Um, I, I'd like to make the point that this, in, in my view, this is the most severe and urgent uh, forest health threat in the Adirondacks and throughout the Eastern US. And uh, it needs more attention, both for, from a policy perspective and also from a science perspective. But anyway, I have all these, these pests here. I'm gonna to try to go through quickly a little bit of introduction of each of those. I'm gonna talk about all the ones on the left and a couple of the ones on the right. So let's start with the beech bark disease. Uh, this is actually, it's a combination, uh, uh, we call it a disease, but it's actually an interaction of a scale insect, uh, the beech scale, and uh, several different fungi of the genus Neonectria. Uh, so what happens is the beech scale insect, which is an introduced insect, uh, attacks the tree, it pokes its spiral through the bark, and the holes caused by these insects uh, allow the entry of these fungi. The fungi grow in the bark and they cause bark cankers that eventually uh, girdle the whole tree and kill it. So the photo in the upper left here is a, is a photo of, this, of the scale insect, much magnified. You, you never see this. What you see is a white woolly substance on the bark that is the covering that these insects put over themselves uh, to keep themselves from drying out and to, and to avoid predators. So you, this is the actual insect that's underneath that uh, covering. And the photo on the right here is the cankers in the bark with the fruiting bodies of the fungi growing out from them. And the photos at the bottom are sort of a succession of what this looks like on a beech tree. A beech tree, I'm sure you know, normally has a very smooth gray bark. It's a beautiful tree. Uh, as it starts to get these uh, woolly uh, insects on it, uh, the beech scale, um, and then the, the fungi starts to engage, you develop these cankers uh, on the bark, these small wounds here. And eventually those grow and, and consume all the bark and that kills the tree. So what happens is this is not like some pests that come in and just kill the tree, boom. It kills trees slowly over 10 years or more. The canopy sort of falls apart and it kills the largest trees first. So if you walk through the Adirondacks, it's rare, very rare to see a large beech tree anymore. Uh, you'll see trees that are a foot in diameter, 18 inches diameter, but you never see the two foot, two and a half foot trees anymore. It, or it's rare to do that. So the, the, the canopy sort of falls apart over time as these cankers consume it. Um, it shifts forest composition and structure in different ways in, in different places. So in some places where the soils are a little less acid, uh, the uh, sugar maple, which is usually the main neighbor of a uh, beech, can take over where the beech dies and you can basically con convert a beech maple stand into a maple stand. And my crew is measuring this down here in this photo in the lower right. We're measuring the canopy cover over where this beach used to be. You can see the stump there. Um, the other thing that can happen, and this happens quite a bit in the Adirondacks, is that what you get is a forest of beach sprouts. So as the tree dies, it sends up sprouts from its roots, and you get this forest of uh, young beach saplings uh, that sort of but they're very difficult to get through and uh, in the ecology business we call it beach hell because they're so hard to sample uh, but um, those that happens in places where the soil is a more acidic and uh, and sugar maple has a, a difficult time gaining a foothold and, and as I said you often see that in the Adirondacks. Um, beach is important for a number of reasons not only is it one of the most dominant trees in the Adirondacks uh, it is a, a, an old growth tree itself. It can last for a very long time. Very important for source of food for wildlife because the beech nuts are the only hard mass species. That means a hard nut that's produced. Uh, and that's important for a lot of wildlife, like things like uh, turkeys and small mammals, chipmunks and squirrels and so forth, but also bears. And I, I put this photo of a bear claw on a, on a beech tree uh, to remind me to, to say that. So I don't know if you've seen this, but the bears will actually climb the beech tree. They can't reach out to the end where the beech nuts are, but they sit up there and shake the beech tree until the nuts come down. And then they come down to the ground and hoover them up off the ground. So uh, bears rely on beech nuts for fattening up in the fall. Now, here's why we're particularly worried about this in, in the Adirondacks. It's because this, this map shows the range of beech. The red line outlines the range and the the colored dots uh, uh, are an estimate of the density of beech trees in the forest in those areas. And you can see that the Adirondacks is really the center of density within the beech range. This is the place where beech are most dominant. And so the fact that this disease has changed the structure of the beech uh, community in 
in the Adirondacks is really important to the species as a whole. There is some resistance to this disease in the beach population. I haven't done work on that in the Adirondacks. I have done it in the Catskills. There in the Catskills, we can see about uh, maybe 10% of the beech trees. Have, I guess I wouldn't say resistance. They have tolerance of the disease, meaning they show some sign of the disease, but it doesn't seem to be killing them. So some beech will persist in the face of the disease. And of course we have uh, these sprouts coming up. So basically what it's doing in many places is shifting the beach population from one of large trees to one of small trees that grow up for a while, get the disease, die, sprout some more, and so on. So we're changing the beach from a majestic tree into a small and, and runty tree. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the beach leaf disease. This is a new disease. Uh, it was first discovered in around the Cleveland, Ohio area in 2014. Um, and it also attacks American beach. It seems to be uh, caused by a nematode, a very small microscopic worm uh, that inhabits the, the leaves uh, and attacks them early when they're just uh, unfolding. And the symptom that causes the, the characteristic striping on, on the leaf, this is a, a photo of it from, from the Cleveland area. Um, so this is spread into New York state. You can see it's spread along the Great Lakes and we have quite a bit of it out in Western New York. It also jumped to Long Island. Uh, it's in Connecticut as well, but uh, the DEC has been surveying for this and they found uh, populations of this beach leaf disease in, uh, southern, in southern Hudson Valley, the lower Hudson Valley. So we don't know yet because this is so new, we don't know how far it will spread. We don't know if the cold of the Adirondacks will inhibit it or not. Uh, we're just uh, trying to figure that out as it goes along. Uh, we also don't know how lethal it will be to beech trees. It seems to be quite lethal to saplings at this point. We don't know if it'll kill uh, canopy trees. That's uh, still, uh, there's a lot of research going on right now on that. But I can tell you that it's not gonna do beech any good. Now uh, the next one I wanted to talk about is balsam woolly adelgid. This is one that doesn't get much uh, press. Its cousin, the hemlock woolly adelgid does get a lot of press, but balsam woolly adelgid has been around for a long period of time. Um, it attacks fir trees, uh, true firs, not Douglas firs. Uh, it's a very important on fir trees in the Western US. Um, in the Smoky Mountains, it basically wiped out the Fraser firs uh, in, the, in the Southern Appalachians. If you've been up to the Smoky Mountains, particularly when this was at its peak uh, uh, around the 1980s and 1990s, most of the Fraser fir up there were dead. And it's been in the Adirondacks for quite some time, according to entomologists that I know, but it's only been in the last few years that it's really uh, started to take a toll. And you see this primarily on the bark. You see these woolly, uh, white woolly uh, um, patches on the bark. This is the balsam fir near Minerva, where my camp is. Um, this tree that I took this picture on actually survived this so far, but we lost a number of trees around there um, uh, due to the disease. And this, this video, this short video here, uh, is it shows the, the pond where our camp is and all of those dead trees are balsam fir that have died from the balsam woolly adelgid over the last couple of years. If you drive through the Adirondacks south of the high peaks, uh, if you drive uh, 28N from North Creek up to Long Lake or you drive with 28 from North Creek to Indian Lake to Blue Mountain Lake and out to Inlet and Old Forge, all along the side of the road, you'll see lots of firs that are dead from, from this disease. So this is having a major effect on fir trees. Uh, we, we haven't done a survey, so we know exactly how widespread it is, but I can tell you at least south of the high peaks, it's quite widespread. And the next one I wanna talk about is gypsy moth. And uh, a lot of you have had an experience with gypsy moth this year. It's had a major outbreak in uh, the Adirondacks, also in central and western New York. Uh, this was introduced a long time ago in 1869 in the Boston area, and it quickly spread uh, throughout the eastern U.S., as far south as North Carolina, and as far west as Wisconsin. It's major, it's, it starts normally, uh, gypsy moth outbreaks start in usually oak stands or aspen stands, but once they get into outbreak mode, like they were this year in parts of the Adirondacks, they'll basically eat anything that's green. And so they'll eat maples or birches or even pines, even conifers. There's been quite a bit of research on, on, on gypsy moth and we know that it reduces tree growth for quite some time. It reduces seed crops, so acorn production in the oaks. Reduces transpiration 
um, and uh, increases the amount of soil water. So with all the rain that we've had in the Adirondacks this year, uh, the stream flow has probably been made worse by the fact that uh, the gypsum moth has defoliated many of the forests, especially down in lower elevations where the oaks are most dominant. And there can be loss of nutrients from the stands as, these, uh, as the nutrients leach out uh, from the soils. As I said, it initially favors oak and aspen stands, but once it gets going, it, it's a generalist, it will be just about anything. And most trees, here's the good news, most trees recover from this, particularly hardwood deciduous trees, but some will die. And the ones that will die are the ones that were already stressed for some reason. Uh, they were in a droughty situation or they're wounded or something like that, those can die. And also conifers. So most hardwood trees can tolerate a year of defoliation, uh, conifers can't. So if we have a mixed stand that had oaks and pines in it, uh, gypsum moth started, uh, it defoliated the oaks, defoliated the pines, the oaks will come back next year and the pines won't. So this can change the uh, composition of the forest quite quickly. I, I would like to point out that there is a, a, a fungal disease of the gypsy moth that's helping us out. This was a bit of a surprise. Uh, it's called Entomophaga mimiga. Uh, it was, it's, a, it's an interesting story because um, it was uh, introduced as a biological, biological control agent for gypsy moth uh, back in the 19 teens sometime, I think it was. And it didn't work. So they gave up on it and they started controlling gypsy moth with chemicals and BT and other uh, compounds. So they just gave up on it. And then in uh, about 1990, this fungus shows up again in the gypsy moth population as an effective biological control agent. And nobody knows exactly why uh, this happened. They don't know if it was a new introduction of the you know, inadvertent introduction of this disease or whether it evolved some virulence. Uh, these gypsy moths here on this tree are all dead from the uh, fungus. You can see they're hanging there upside down. Uh, and so it can be quite virulent, quite lethal to gypsy moth populations once it gets going. And uh, if we're lucky, uh, this fungus has uh, started to um, uh, take hold in the Adirondacks and that would put a damper on the expected gypsy moth outbreak for next year. Usually gypsy moth outbreaks are two or three years in, in length, um, but with the advent of this uh, fungal disease, they tend to be only a year and maybe a, a lesser um, outbreak in the second year. Uh, we don't know exactly what controls, whether this, uh, this fungus really attacks the gypsy moth population in a given year, uh, but um, there, there are people that are, are working on that. Okay, so we have we have some help here with, with the gypsy moth population. Hopefully that will save us in the Adirondacks from another outbreak uh, next year. Okay, I wanna move on to hemlock woolly adelgid. Now we're talking about the, the insects that have a toehold in the, in, in the Adirondacks. I'm sure you've heard of hemlock woolly adelgid and I just talked about it a bit about the ecological impacts. You can see on the map on the left that the hemlock woolly adelgid is primarily in the Southern part of the state, uh, but there have been a couple of, um, uh, populations noticed within the blue line in the Adirondacks. The first one was on Prospect Mountain near uh, Lake George uh, in 2017. And then just last summer, they found uh, several different, several other stands on the east shore of um, Lake George that were infested with this hemlock woolly adelgid. And the DEC is trying to eradicate it in all cases. Um, so, uh, we're, we're trying to, or the, the DEC is trying to keep this out of the Adirondack Park. I think that in the long term, it's going to um, be here. I don't think there's much we can do about it, uh, but um, it, it will seems to be happening at least fairly slowly. And the reason that we're so worried about that is you can see this from the map on the, on the right, which is the density of hemlock uh, in New York State. And you can see that hemlock is an extremely important species in the Adirondacks, particularly around the lower elevations on the fringes of the Adirondacks, uh, extremely uh, high density of hemlock in those stands. And so if uh, hemlock woolly adelgid does get a toehold in the Adirondacks, it would be a, a big impact on the forest. I think hemlock is the third most abundant tree in, in the Adirondacks. And so that's a, that's a big deal. So that's why we're worried about hemlock woolly adelgid. The next one to talk about is emerald ash borer. It's another one I'm sure you've heard of. This was a this is a tiny uh, wood boring insect uh, introduced into uh, the area around Detroit, Michigan, sometime in the 1990s. It was first discovered in 2002, and it's been spreading ever since, despite 
Herculean efforts to stop it, it has managed to continue to spread. It's now in 36 states across the country and it's still spreading. It seems to be almost 100% lethal to ash trees. That's all the ash trees in the genus. And there are, I think, 16 species of ash in, in, uh, in, the, in North America. Uh, within New York State, you can see in the map on the left, the red dots are uh, the places where the emerald ash borer was first discovered in a county. Uh, so there's a red dot in every county where it's been discovered there. Uh, and just looking at that map, you can see at this point, there's really only one county uh, within the blue line uh, that has an emerald ash borer outbreak. As far as I know, that's Warren County. There's been several uh, uh, stands with emerald ash borer found uh, near the Screen River and then down towards Warrensburg. Uh, so, and again, the DEC is trying to eradicate them. But if you just step back and take a look at that map, you can see that the emerald ash borer has a surrounding. Uh, and uh, the odds of keeping it out of the Adirondack Park, I would say, are quite low. Uh, this is somewhat less of a worry than the hemlock woolly adelgid, and that's, you can see that on the map on the right, that's the distribution of ash in New York State. So uh, ash is, uh, you know, certainly it's, its most dominant uh, uh, stands are uh, towards the western part of the state, and also way downstate uh, near New York City. Uh, the Adirondacks has a very generally a low dominance of ash. This can be this can be somewhat misleading though. I mean, so I'm down here now in Dutchess County, which is down here, uh, and it also looks like a low dominance of ash. But we've had the emerald ash borer through here, and there are uh, dead ash trees everywhere. And when I go hiking in the Adirondacks, I see ash trees everywhere. So you're going to notice the dead trees when this when this finally um, uh, gets through in the Adirondacks. This is the most destructive pest we've ever introduced into the US. Uh, and then the last one I'd like to talk about is the Asian longhorn beetle, because this is probably the scariest. Uh, this is a large beetle. You can see the size of it from that picture. Uh, it is um, brought into the country usually in wood packaging material. I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Um, but it has had a number of outbreaks throughout the country. Uh, you can see the red and green dots on this map. Uh, the red dots are places where there's still an active outbreak of this insect. The green dots are places where there's been an outbreak, but the federal government has gone in and tried to eradicate uh, the uh, insects. Uh, and uh, so, for instance, I showed you the picture of Worcester, Massachusetts. That was an Asian longhorn beetle outbreak. That is still an active outbreak. That's that red spot right there. Um, they're still taking trees. They've taken 36,000 trees out of the city of Worcester. Uh, and they're still taking trees out to try to quell this outbreak. Uh, there's uh, still an active outbreak in Long Island, and they, there's an outbreak in the Cincinnati area of Ohio, and they just last summer found another outbreak in South Carolina near Charleston. So this keeps popping up, uh, and the reason that it's such a concern for us is that its major host, its favorite host, is maple trees. And of course, maple trees are the dominant species in in the Adirondacks, red maple and sugar maple. So should this ever get loose and uh, start to spread in the Adirondacks, it would be a huge problem. Uh, we have spent, we as the taxpayers, have spent a lot of money tr in trying to eradicate this pest in places where it has popped up, but it just keeps popping. Okay, so that's my quick uh, uh, flight through the, the pests that are a serious problem or a threat in the Adirondacks. I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking about how we might solve this problem. Um, and the first thing to know is that for these established and widespread pests, eradication is virtually impossible. So if we have a small outbreak of something like the, uh, the Asian longhorn beetle, it's a lot of effort. Taking 36,000 trees out of a city is a lot of effort, but it is still possible at that scale. And when we're talking about something like the uh, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid or the emerald ash borer, eradication is virtually impossible. The only thing you do is probably try to control it. Uh, and one method of controlling it is a biological control, and that has a lot of potential, uh, but it is difficult to make it work, and it's not always successful with forest pests. In fact, there's probably even more instances where it's not successful than in instances where it is. Uh, I would like to call out, though, the New York State Hemlock Initiative at Cornell. Uh, that is developing biological control for hemlock woolly adelgid. This is Mark Whitmore and his colleagues at Cornell. Uh, they are working on a, a number of different insects. They, they feel they need more than one insect to try to control the hemlock woolly adelgid, and they're releasing them at various places around 
uh, in New York State. So uh, I, I wish them luck and I certainly hope they're successful at that. Um, the Forest Service is also doing research on biocontrol efforts for emerald ash borers so far have not been uh, successful, but they're still working on that. So biological control is a possibility for these insects, but it's by no means a sure thing. And of course, if you get to the point where the, um, uh, the tree has pretty much disappeared uh, from, because of the pest, uh, then your only option is resistance breeding, trying to breed uh, trees that are resistant to the pest. That's what's going on with chestnut and elm now. And then that, that's only the beginning. Then you have to try to restore the forest. So you try to get these species back into the position they were in the, in the forest previously. And that's, so that is a very long-term proposition. That's probably centuries worth of uh, restoration of the forest to try to, for instance, return the chestnut to its former glory. So that, that of course is another option. But when I see this, you know, I, I, I say, oops, um, let me click on that. So it seems to me that it makes most sense to keep these invasive pests out of the country in the first place, rather than trying to deal with them after they're already here. And in order to do that, because these are coming in on international trade, we need stronger federal policies to promote clean trade. So we need to have trade that doesn't have these pests in it. And that, so that's my starting point for talking about how to solve this problem. Okay. So let's close the door on these forest pests. How do we do that? In order to do it, we need to focus on the major pathways of introduction. And we know what those pathways are. Uh, this has been well researched. The two major pathways are number one, live woody plants that are brought in for landscaping, for the horticulture trade, basically. This has been the source of most of our pests in the past. Um, and it's still uh, an open door for a lot of pests. Well, the second major pathway is solid wood packaging material, things like crates and pallets. Uh, they're made with solid wood in some other country. They could have a wood boring insect inside them. Uh, they're brought over here, usually in a shipping container. Uh, the shipping container is sent to its destination and it's opened up. The pallet is brought out and left in the yard and the insect hatches out of the pallet and away we go. Uh, that has been the source of many of our most destructive pests recently because of the increased use of containerized shipping. Huge ships with uh, tens of thousands of, of containers on them going across the ocean from port to port. That's pretty much uh, anything we get internationally has come on a container ship and has probably resided on a wood pallet for, for some portion of its uh, uh, trip. So uh, I think we all saw the images of that huge container ship stuck in the Suez Canal a few weeks ago. That ship had 20,000 uh, containers on it. Probably most of them had wood pallets inside. I don't, I don't know where the, the, ship, the ship was headed, but you can imagine of the scale of the, of the problem if we have huge ships like that going back and forth across the ocean. So we do have policies in place to try to prevent pests from coming into the country on both of these pathways. Um, unfortunately, the policies aren't working very well. So for live plants, basically it requires an inspection at a plant inspection station near one of the ports. Um, and there's been some analysis done of this, of this the effect, efficacy of, these, uh, of this uh, policy. And it's found that it's about 28% effective at uh, catching the pests that are coming out on these plants. And it's not that a guy like this, uh, who's one of these inspectors is doing a bad job. It's just that we have something like 2.6 billion plants imported into this country every year and they can only inspect a small portion of them. And also many of these pests and diseases are just hard to see. They spend part of their life inside the plant. You can't see it visually. So this is not a great system and it doesn't work very well. Uh, for solid wood packaging material, there's an international regulation that says that wood packaging, pallets and crates and so forth, uh, if it's shipped internationally, uh, needs to be treated to get the pests out of it. And there's two treatments allowed. One is heat treatment, and the other is fumigation with methyl, methyl bromide. And there's been analysis done of the rate of infestation of material coming into the US before and after this policy was put in place. And it's found that it's about 36 to 52% effective. So it helps, but it definitely doesn't solve the problem. And an extrapolation of uh, these numbers by the authors of the paper showed that we're probably allowing about 13,000 infested shipments into the country every year. So that's 13,000 opportunities for new wood boring pests to get loose in the US every year uh, because of uh, the ineffectiveness of this policy. So 
you know, partially good news, but in general, uh, we're not doing well enough to keep these things out of the country. I'd like to point out most people think about, you know, how to prevent these pests. Well, let's just inspect at the border. Uh, but inspection, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. There's just too much stuff coming in. We get about 25 million shipping containers coming into the country every year, and we can only inspect about one or 2% of them. Uh, Customs and Border Protection, they are the people who actually do the uh, inspections at the ports. They do a great job and they're really into it. They really like to inspect these things and find the pests in there. But there's a limit to how much they can inspect. And so it's only about one to two percent. And again, wood boring insects are hard to find. So you can imagine you're trying to find an insect that's buried in a board that's part of a pallet that's at the bottom of a shipping container on a ship that's filled with 20,000 shipping containers. I mean, that's just a, a darn hard job. And, and uh, that's why we're going to miss a lot of them. On the other hand, uh, inspection is really important. It's our main deterrent uh, because if uh, shipments are coming in and they're found to have pests in them, there's major fines. They can, the importers can be fined up to the value of the shipment, which can be millions of dollars. Plus, uh, the shipment is turned around and sent out. It has to go back to where it came from, or at least somewhere else, it has to get out of the country. Uh, and that's expensive also. So uh, this, this is our deterrent. This is the cop with the radar gun. Um, just knowing that he's out there slows traffic down in general. So, um, and the, the other thing is that this inspection provides crucial data about what ship, what kinds of shipments are likely to be infested, where, where they come from, what kinds of commodities and so forth. So it provides us data on how we're doing here. So we have um, put together a group, on a, a, a group of actions that we think uh, will prevent new forest pest invasions and we call it tree smart trade. I'll just run through them real quick for you here. Uh, number one, we should switch to pest-free packaging material for international shipments. I think, I think that seems obvious. So we'll, if mostly like 95% of the pallets we, that are in use these days are made of solid wood. If we ship, the switch to things like uh, manufactured wood, like uh, um, ply wood or OSB or one of those, uh, that would keep the pests out because the pests can't uh, inhabit that kind of wood. Or it could be recycled plastic, or in some cases, companies are just opting not to use pallets at all. They can load more into their shipping container if they do that. So there, there are many options there. We need to restrict the importation of live plants, particularly live plants that are in the same genus as plants that live in North America, because those are the ones that are most likely to transmit pests and diseases to our plants. We need to expand our early detection and rapid response programs. These are the programs that we use for surveillance to see if there's an outbreak. Uh, and then we respond to try to eradicate that outbreak before it gets big. This is what's happening with the Asian longhorn beetle in those cities that, that I pointed out. We need to do a better job at that. Right now, the, the uh, early detection rapid response programs are fragmented between different agencies and they don't make enough use of citizen scientists and tree professionals, things like uh, arborists and city tree crews and things like that. We need to tighten enforcement of current regulations. Uh, we've been some action on that. I'll tell you about it in just a second. And we need to expand our international pest prevention programs with key trading partners. So we need to work with the trading partners to make sure those shipments are clean before they leave the port, rather than just relying on our inspection when it comes in. So those are the actions that we consider tree smart trade. And that's just sort of a high level view of them. If you want a more in-depth view, you can get this policy brief online at, at www.treesmarttrade.org, which is a, a, a site that's put together by the Cary Institute. Uh, you can download the policy brief. It tells you a bit about the problem, but also lists it specifically what agencies we think ought to do what in order to try to save this, uh, solve this problem. So moving forward. Um, what are we doing? So we're advocating for stronger policies. Uh, I work a lot with uh, both uh, federal agencies and legislators in, in Congress. Uh, we're building a coalition of NGOs and scientists to uh, raise the profile of this issue and, and advocate for change. We're also working with private companies uh, to clean up supply chains. And I'll talk about that in just a second. And we're also trying to increase communication because we found that uh, many people, and, and that includes legislators, uh, aren't aware of this problem. They uh, perhaps know, they know about some of the pests, they know about hemlock lily adelgid or emerald ash borer, but they see them as individual problems. They don't see them as all symptoms of the same problem, which is what they are. They're all symptoms of, a, of the problem of uh, sort of lax regulation of international trade. So we need to communicate to talk about the seriousness of the problem and the fact that solutions are available to solve the problem if you have the will to do it. 
Uh, and that's what we're trying to do with uh, things like this uh, webinar that I'm doing now. Also uh, talking to journalists, we have a, a Twitter uh, account that's uh, on social media. And uh, we're, so we're just trying to ramp up the communication here. So what can you do about this? Uh, certainly one thing you can do is don't move firewood. Uh, that won't keep uh, pests out of the country, but it will keep them from spreading around. Some of the pests keep them from spreading around once they're here. Uh, particularly the emerald ash borer and also the Asian longhorn beetle moves when people take firewood from one place to another uh, and it gets out in the new place and starts a new outbreak. A lot of emerald ash borer outbreaks on near campgrounds. Uh, second thing is you can buy only native plants. If we reduce the demand for the import of, of plants from other countries, uh, eventually you know, we'll reduce the number of uh, pests that are coming in on those plants. And lastly, and I think most importantly, you need to speak up. And that means you can contact your federal representatives uh, because this really is a federal government problem. This is international trade. There's not much that the state of New York can do about this. Um, but uh, federal, uh, the federal legislators and also federal agencies can solve this problem. And you can also contact your local and national environmental organizations uh, most of them are aware of this problem, but it's not high on the priority list and it ought to be. So I'd like to call out in particular the Adirondack environmental organizations of which you know there are several. Um, this is, as I said, the major forest health problem in the, in the, in the uh, Adirondacks and these environmental organizations ought to be involved. Now think back to the acid rain days when the voices of the Adirondack environmental organizations were very important in uh, developing federal legislation uh, on acid rain. And they could do the same role on these forest pests if they stepped up and, and contacted legislators and uh, used their communications uh, skills to get the word out about this. And lastly, you can sign our petition to demand a congressional hearing on this issue. If you go to www.change.org slash stop forest pests, you can sign the petition we are working with legislators to try to get a, uh, a hearing on this that will raise the profile of the issue and call some of the leaders of uh, customs and USDA uh, to the hearing to have them discuss why they, uh, why we're still getting so many forest pests into the country. Okay, uh, just to finish up, uh, there, I wanna say that we are making progress. Uh, there's a new policy, the Customs and Border Protection have been great on this. They put in place a new policy for more stringent enforcement of the woodpacking regu regulations. They're doing more fining and more uh, turning ships back. And it's had a large impact on uh, importers. They all of a sudden, they're very interested in finding a way to solve this problem. That's exactly what ought to happen. If you put the regulations in place the right way, uh, it, uh, it motivates private industry to solve the problem. Uh, we put a provision in the 2018 Farm Bill that required USDA to do a comprehensive report on this issue and its possible solutions. That report came out in March of uh, this year and it was uh, underwhelming, I would have to say, uh, but it does provide a springboard for this public hearing that we're talk talking about having. Um, we're also working with private companies, uh, shipping companies in particular, to develop voluntary measures that they could use to minimize pests in wood packaging. And as I said, they're very motivated by the fact that they're getting fined by customs for every uh, uh, incidence of these pests in their uh, wood packaging that they bring in. So these are three hopeful signs, three good things going on that tells us that we, if we take action, we can solve this problem. I'm gonna skip that because of the time. But I will just say, I'd like to finish by saying this problem can be solved, uh, but we need everybody's help in order to do that. We all need to speak up for stronger federal action on this. So you can, as I said, sign that petition. If you want more information about this, you can go to the website. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Please follow us on Twitter. Uh, or you can just email me at that email address there uh, for more information. So thank you for listening. I think we have a few minutes left, left and I would love to take questions.